Hi, my name is Barbara Chamberlain. I'm with the NMSU Learning Games Lab. I was asked recently to give a little talk about game development for programmers and, and kind of help them think of what kind of things we've learned from development in the past 20 years. And, and so I came up with some tips and I, I just wanted to put them in a little video for others who are looking to get into game design and would like to know what those recommendations are. You're free to contact me, bchamber at nmsu.edu if you have questions, or follow me on Twitter at bchamber for other game ideas that that I have. At the Learning Games Lab at New Mexico State University, we develop a wide variety of games. All of our games are educational. We fit the university's method of outreach where we try to take university-based research and, and put it to use, whether that's about math or science learning or food safety or nutrition or any of the, the missions and research for our university. One of our games, for example, is Ninja Kitchen. You can play that now on ninjakitchengame.org. Ninja Kitchen is really targeting middle school students who are just now learning and establishing their food preparation practices. Mid-school is when you start to learn how to cook cook and we do a lot of game design to teach kids or players something that they don't know that they don't know and maybe don't want to know so we make a game so you can see kind of as our early storyboards of Ninja Kitchen um, our goal is to, to introduce you to food preparation in a very gradual, scaffolded way. So you can do that in a safe way. When to wash your hand, cook food to the proper temperatures. And what has come out of it is a game that's a lot of fun to play, that you play because it's fun, not necessarily because you're learning. Science Pirates, The Curse of Brown Beard is one of our games we did a few years ago. It has rats singing about auger plates and really helps you learn the scientific process. That's its scientific uh, that's at sciencepirates.org. Uh, we also do a lot of apps, uh, games and apps and toys. Eat and move o -Matic was the first app for the National 4-H Council. Um, in this app, it's really just a toy. It's a spinner where you can compare calories in or calories you consume and how long it takes to burn those calories off doing different activities or what if instead of a large milkshake, you have a small milkshake and you can look at comparisons for that. That's on the iOS app store. Math Snacks is a big project we're working on now. That's at mathsnacks.org. This targets content frequently misunderstood by sixth grade students, though it's been very popular for grades third through six. Uh, there's some apps for that, a series of animations, a series of games. All of those are available online for play. Um, some of those, for example, our animations are all in, a, in an app for iOS you can get as well that's related to that. One of those games is Game Over Gopher. It's a game that teaches how to place coordinate or how to place pairs on a, on a coordinate plane. Uh, it's really, it's a tower defense game. It's just lovely and beautiful and again so much fun to play for adults who already know this or for kids who are learning it for the first time. Um, some very creative and different ways to introduce how to use graphs for this for this age group. But I wanted to, based on our experience of 20 years doing this, just put together five game design tips. And these aren't necessarily all of our tips or my most important tips or the ones I've learned the hardest. They're just kind of five tips that I thought could start discussion for people as they go through this. The first is to develop with the team. We do this here. Not only does our team have programmers and artists and animators working on it, but our program, our team has researchers or teachers or, or members of the subject uh, target audience. We just always find development works better when you have a group of people sitting at the table. You certainly learn from each other, but working with other people forces you to articulate your ideas. And in describing to other people what your ideas are, you get a greater level of clarity in your ideas. Expressing them forces you to, um, to clarify them. It reduces fatigue if you don't have to do everything yourself, programming and art and sound. You can depend on other people. But really it yields better brainstorming. Multiple brains bring better ideas to the table and you can troubleshoot ideas and as you're saying things and working through them you can kind of refine out, is this even a good idea? I don't know. We just are always happier working in a team. Ultimately it comes down to this. Even if you can, it doesn't necessarily mean you should. You may well have the ability to program and do the art and the sound, but even the programmers on our team, they often say, yeah, I can work alone, but I'm usually happier when I have other people helping me out with multiple ideas. Game design tip number two is this. Don't just play games talk about games. I hear that all the time, that if you want to make games, you got to play games. Make games, you got to play games. And ooh, absolutely that's true. But I say it's not enough to play games. You have to be able to talk about games and articulate what makes 
Angry Birds good? What makes Angry Birds bad if you don't like it? How does Grand Theft Auto introduce mechanics that could be put in an educational game? Um, why is a, a level-based achievement where you can get one, two, or three stars better in some circumstances than scoring mechanic? The game that you hate, why do you hate it? The game that you love but has horrible graphics, why is it good despite those things? Whether you're talking about games with other people or keeping a personal journal or a blog, Every app, every game that you play, don't be content to finish the game until you are also able to describe what parts of it really work and what parts don't. When you're able to do that, you are better able to incorporate those components into your games um, and which components for which game. In our, in our design sessions, we are always talking about other game mechanics and how that incorporates. So, for example, I think if you're going to make games, you should be able to tell and explain to me what three games every developer should play. And of course, those are going to be different for everybody. But I want to know for you, what games really inspire you, and more importantly, what components of those games worked and why, why they inform our field. Game design tip number three is, is this. Instead of focusing on what the game will look like, first define what your player will do, feel, or know when they play the game. We sometimes get so hung up in our idea and how it's going to work out and our characters in the play, and we see that so clearly in our mind. Well, that's going to change. It just is. When you play a game, when you design a game, rather, it is going to change and evolve throughout the process. And you want it to. Embrace that. Plan for that. You plan for that by articulating not just what you want your, your game to look like, but by knowing when my player is playing this game I want, what is it going to do? What are they going to do, feel, know? Are they going to play it all the way through and then be done with it? Or is it a game they come back to regularly? Is it a 15 hours of gameplay or do I want them to have a game they can come back and play 30 minutes or two minutes at a time? If it's an educational game, what should they be able to do or know when they are finished? What do they feel? Games are emotional experiences. Do they feel um, frustrated but then really happy? Do they feel sad? Do they feel joyful? What is the experience like for your player? Write these things down so that as this game that you have in your mind changes through development and then you change this to fix that and then you change this to fix that and you change this to fix that you can always go back to what you wanted to create in the first place as a check because we create educational games or learning games we created a design model and I, I have a document that is published in the the journal of international journal of game-based learning that explains exactly how we do that what our guiding questions are how we write that down and then it has a capable, couple of game studies um, case studies where I explain how we did that for each game. So if, if you're interested in this, particularly for learning games, go grab that journal and, um, and take a look at the July-September 2012 issue if you'd like some more information on how we do that. Game design tip number four. All done is only half begun. Oh, this is painful. I know it is, but you know, you're going to get your game, your first fully playable version. Great. You're halfway there. Now go test it. Use it with others. Check it out. Fix this. Fix that. Change your graphics. Improve it. Improve it. Improve it. Improve it. That first playable is the halfway point. I want to show you our site where we document all of our versions for Game Over Gopher, the game I showed images of earlier in this. So 45 versions easily. Notice we, we finished it up about May of 2012. These are all the different versions that we had. 45 versions. We started in May of 2011. And the truth is, all these different versions and, and themes and tests and different skins and a new version for testing and then another version for testing. I really think we were about version 18, 19, 20 when we had a really good playable version all the way through that we could test for knowledge gain. That was just halfway. And the rest was refining and changing and testing and making changes. And that really brings me to my game design tip number five, which is start with a solid mechanic and then polish, polish, polish. Once you get that game good and working and the interface works and people know how to play it and they're enjoying it and it's fun, polish it. Polish the heck out of it. Polish your audio, polish your graphics, polish your interface. Change it, change it, change it. We, even once we had Game Over where we considered it, uh, Game Over Gopher, we considered it done and good. We took a step from it for two, for about two weeks, for a month, and then we came back and we pretended, okay, what if we were being really snooty and this is someone else's game? 
How could they make it better? How could we make it better? That's the level of polish that distinguishes a game. It's the kind of polish that distinguishes a pretty good opening screen from a beautiful opening screen that really brings you in and has an implied story to it. It's the difference between a tutorial that just tells you what to do and a tutorial that helps you learn how to do it by doing it in the game itself. It's the difference between a level screen, which is fine and looks nice and professional, and every element being playful and fun and conducive to the storyline. That's what polish will bring you. And it's the difference between a game that you're proud of and a game that you look back on years later and say, oh, yeah, it's still good. It still stands the test of time. Look for ways to add polish. I think that ultimately the best game engages the user with an experience. A game just isn't about playing. A game is about bringing your user in and giving them a full experience all the way through. And so to do that, remember, you're not just designing a game. You're designing that experience, that emotion, that playability, that usability. Find ways to build all of those things. With that in mind, if you have any questions, you want more information from me, please contact me.